Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Saturday morning, March 26th, the day before the tour was upon us. After breakfast, we all went to the garage where the 1904 St. Louis was delivered to and awaiting our arrival. Many other cars participating in the tour were also there, going through whatever maintenance and mechanical work needed before the big day. This was truly a special occasion, and Bob wanted to share his thoughts on the day. Well, hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. I am here with Bob Leibesberger, the man of the hour, the patriarch of the car behind us, which is the 1904 St. Louis. We are here in Newport, Rhode Island at the Audrain Automotive Museum, where we're about to, on the morrow, go and drive this thing on a great little uh, rally. And so, Bob, thanks for being with us today, and would you, would you share with us, uh, why are we here? What is inspiring you to be here with this car today? Well, let me tell the story of the, the Tipkin part of the story first, and then we'll get to my story. Uh, this all begins with Henry Timken, who invented the tapered roller bearing in 1898. He got it patented, and then he was the next door neighbor to a man by the name of George Doris, who was the designer of the St. Louis motor carriage car. What was happening in the auto industry, the, the Winton was considered the king of the of the auto industry in 1899, and people were ordering cars from Winton and he couldn't keep up. And this resulted in people like Packard and people like George Doris deciding they were gonna build their own. So that's the beginning. Now, Henry Timken was the next door neighbor of, of George Doris, and George was a very innovative man. For example, he uses rack and pinion steering on this car. He uses he, uh, uh, he, he integrated the transmission and the, and the engine in one casting because people like Ransom Olds was having chains connecting the engine to the transmission and the, the, the transmission with chains to the, to the uh, rear axle. And they were having trouble with the chains coming off. So, Henry, so uh, George Doris had a number of innovations but the big innovation was the use of Timken bearings. And let's uh, talk about this bearing. There we go. When we, when we took this... Get a good look, look at this. When we took this car apart, we found in uh, the bearing, the first bearing that Henry Timken sold to George Doris. And we, st the, we still have the original purchase order for those bearings. Three sets of axles were built by the Timken company. Not only the bearings, but the axles were built by the Timken Company, or then the Timken Company. Now what you see here is an, an integral bearing. Pre-adjusted paper roller bearings are such that you have to use two of them in pairs. And so you have them pre-adjusted so that the clearance is correct in the bearing. You have seals. We thought we invented this bearing in 1970. Actually, we invented it for the, what we called the AP bearing on railroad uh, in 1954. We built a bearing just like this, a sealed pre-adjusted bearing for the railroad industry. And then in the 1970s, when the auto industry wanted to simplify the assembly of bearings, they, of, of front axles, they encouraged us to make a pre-adjusted bearing. So in, in 1970, we developed that bearing there. Okay, so the center one here, I understand this is the 1970 bearing, correct? This the shiny one, right? Okay, but yet all around here, this is the roller bearing that I believe this was the the bearing that was on this That's car. That car, correct? Okay, from from uh, 1904, right? right? So right. You, you said that it was invented in the 1970s, but it sounds like you invented it a whole lot sooner. You invented it when Henry Timken invented it, <laughs> right? So, and of course, Henry Timken. When he, got the, when he launched the company, he uh, turned it over to his sons, H.H. H. Timken, and uh, then uh, uh, William Robert was his brother, and they took over the, the manufacturer. So Henry Timken, uh, 
after he after he launched the company, he left the company. Now what what happened? And let me before I go there, let me talk about the the engine. Oh. Sure. Talk about the engine to this car. Yeah, the engine to this car. That's the piston. Look at this piston. I mean, are you talking about a coffee can here? Yeah. Uh, that, that piston, or that the displacement of this engine is only 130 cubic inches, believe it or not, and rated at about seven horsepower. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> but it runs well, and uh, we we love it. Well, we're going to see how well it runs here uh, tomorrow, right. aren't we? We sure are. Oh yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah, this, uh, this it's big piston, obviously, great bearings, and and Bob. When it comes to this event that we're at right now, what what is most meaningful for you personally to be here at this first okay. Audrey? Before I answer that question, I just want to I just want to finish with one one short thing. Sure. Uh, after Henry launched the company, they decided that they needed to move to, uh, to closer to where the auto industry was being developed, and that was in Cleveland. The Winton Company in Cleveland was the largest manufacturer of bearings of automobiles oh. in, in, uh, in 1899. As I said earlier, people were so demanding for, uh, to get cars that they couldn't meet the production schedule with, the, with their, with their uh, 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 orders, meet their orders. So anyway, uh, Henry Tipkin decided they should move to Canton. And the reason they moved to Canton, there was a good source of the alloy steel there, and they were closer, much closer to where their where their uh, customer was. And also, in, in in 1900, they still were kind of assembling bearings from parts made by other people. So they were an assembler of bearings, and of course, they wanted to start making all their own parts. And they decided they'd move to Canton to be able to do that because of the closest of the steel industry there. Right, and and not only did you have the closest of the steel in industry, you also had the rail lines that were connecting uh, from Pennsylvania Correct. and elsewhere Correct. to bring in additional fuels. Uh, and, and and it wasn't just Winton that was up in Cleveland at that time. You, you had Peerless was there. You had Baker was there. there were, Baker Electric. Mm -hmm, Baker Electric. Yeah. yeah, so there were... Talk about early. Mm -hmm. Early. Yeah, there, there was a lot going on in Cleveland. I mean, back in... Back at the turn of the 20th century, whether Detroit would be the Motor City was still up for grabs. I mean, you had Cleveland, you what? had Detroit, you had Indianapolis. You, you had White who was making a steamer. White was making in it Cleveland. out of Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. So they thought, they thought the center of the auto industry would be Cleveland. Then came along Henry Ford and Ransom Olds and a few people like that <laughs> who decided it should be Detroit. Yeah. Well, Charles Brady King kind of started that in Detroit. Right. So. Right. right. <laughs> But uh, if I may go back to the uh, okay. question I went about, you know, about this trip and what we're doing this this weekend. Um, let me just ask you, Bob, what does this mean for you? Why is this important to you? Well, I'm uh, I'm in the process of writing my autobiography, and uh, my uh, my grandfather, uh, he never owned a car, never drove a car. He was born in 1865. And he died in 1954, and he never, never drove a car. Mm. And my father was born in 1900, right at the beginning of the auto industry. So I grew up in a house that talked a lot about cars. And we, <laughs> the Leibensburgers, became car people. And uh, good people, good car people. people, good people, car people. <laughs> so that's uh, what's very meaningful for me. Mm. And uh, I know. Uh, are you, are you going to be driving the car at all during the uh, run tomorrow? No, I, I did in the London to Brighton run, but uh, I decided I'm going to leave that to younger people. So I have a pit crew that's going to be uh, operating. As a matter of fact, uh, Gary Husser, uh, who is the chief of my pit crew, he, uh, he helped restore the car when we restored it. Right. And um, you can also see uh, on the channel there's uh, some video of the car and it running, and then we're going to get more of it, of course, this weekend. But what kind of shape was this car in when you first found it? How well, did me, you find this car? Well, let me tell that story as well. Uh, when I became uh, president of the, of the company, uh, we were we were about to we were preparing to celebrate our centennial, and we. Uh, 
and our centennial was going to be celebrated in 1999. And uh, the Temkin uh, the people, the Temkins were still running the company, and the chairman was Tim Temkin. He later became the ambassador to Germany. But he decided we were going to publish a book. And we worked with a lady by the name of Betty Pruitt, who I think is from this part of the, of the world. I think she's from Connecticut, close by. Uh, anyway, uh, we, uh, th this book is not only a history of the Tempe Company, it's a history of the automotive industry. So it's a great, a great book if you want to find out more about the Tempe Company. Now, what happened uh, in, uh, we were, we were in the process of, of preparing for the centennial. We also were in the process of building a new corporate headquarters. And when we were tearing down the building uh, where, where the new corporate headquarters were going to be, we found a whole stash of old Timken memorabilia. And in there is where we found the order for the first set of bearings that Timken ever sold to the auto industry. Wow. So, uh, being a car guy, I was a collector of antique cars myself, and I decided then that I was going to try to find a St. Louis. So I looked high and dry, and I, I uh, wasn't able to find anything. And one day, my uh, good friend Bill Maddox, who was in marketing, came over to my office and said, Bob, uh, I think I found what you're looking for. And he told me the story they, that uh, man in, in, uh, in St. Louis by the name of uh, Chuck Rose, who owned a number of St. Louis's, uh, he was looking for a replacement bearing for this, for a car like this, not this, this car, car. Not this one. But, but one that he was working on. And uh, I said, well, I better go visit my, uh, George, uh, Chuck Rose and see what, he, what he's looking for. So I, my idea was we'd maybe lease the car for the, for the period when we were celebrating the, the uh, centennial. But he, uh, George, uh, Chuck Rhodes said, you know, I know where there's a St. Louis in a barn in Alabama, and my wife doesn't think I need another St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He had three or four at that point. Would you be interested in buying it? I said, for sure. So that's the story. And we bought the St. Louis. And here's what we have. Yes, this is how the car was. That's how it was delivered to Timken. How it was delivered to Timken. Uh, wow. <laughs> and I know that's a, that's a tale as far as how that all came together. Right. And we'll have some more time to go over that right. talk as well. But uh, in any case, what we're about to do here uh, is have an incredible time. We're going to be uh, one of the uh, folks in this run, I believe this is the first actual event that I've Yeah, this is doing. the inaugural event. The inaugural uh, event, kind yeah. of Duplicating what the London to Brighton run was. Mm -hmm. And St. Louis ran in the London to Brighton run in, yeah. in 1999. Yeah. So, uh, so this is this is a, this is a case of you, know, you, you know, start to finish. You know, right. you did the, the London to Brighton in, eight, in 1999 as part of you know the centennial for Timken. Now here it is, here's the inaugural, you know, for the Audrain uh, run, which is, I'm sure, is going to be a big event in the future as well. And uh, you're, we're here, we're part of it, and it's because of, you know, your dedication, you know, and your love for the cars and for what we do that, uh, that we're here today. I have one more point I want to make. When I bought the car, the word got around that I had bought this St. Louis, and uh, one day I had uh, two of the, our associates come into my office, and they said, we know you bought this uh, St. Louis, and uh, we'd like to form a team and volunteer to do the restoration. So we made up a team that there were about 15 associates in Canton who came together and uh, restored this car to perfect condition and did a, just a fantastic job of putting the car back together. Right, and, and making it go from from what we what you originally had you know, to what we, what we have now. And, and I know what we are looking forward to, some, a great weekend, some great times with the car. I know uh, John John Oates is here, I can just walk by. Right. Uh, so we're going to have some fun. And, 
and the folks that are out here in uh, Newport, Rhode Island are going to find out what it means to drive like it's 1909. Right. Or actually 1907. You have to have, the car has to be 1907 or older. No Model T's allowed. Okay. <laughs> but I already saw there's a Winston over there. There's some, some other cars that are going to be in this. And, and, and I think what's really special uh, to me you know, is that you know, this is Ohio history. Uh, this is Timken history, and Bob, I mean, you're part of Timken history. I mean, you were the man that brought that company into the modern digital era. And so, I, I'm just thankful to be here, and I know you're probably looking forward in, to everything that we're going to be doing over this weekend. You know, I want to tell one more story. One more story. One more story. Yes. Okay. Uh, when uh, we were bringing this car back to reservation, the family showed me a picture of H.H. Uh, Timken on his wedding day uh, driving a, a car that looked like this. And I was asked uh, to find out what, what the car was and what, the, what year it was. And this guy here came up with the car. And what year it was there's, there's, yeah, it was an 02 win. 02 win. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a picture maybe we ought to show. I ought to give you the oh, I've got it. You got it. <laughs> I've got a copy. Why don't you show that? <laughs> okay, well, let's... Right, so uh, we're right now, we're going to uh, uh, get ready for the rest of the, today's festivities. Tomorrow, we're going to be actually driving, and there's going to be a lot of cars in it, and we're going to have a great time. Bob? Thanks for us. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of fun. From there, we all headed to a local museum in the Audrain Collection where we were confronted with supercars. McLarens, Lamborghinis, Mercedes. Yeah, if you were into these cars, they'd probably have to hire someone with a mop to follow you and clean up the drool. Once the floors were clean again, we headed off to lunch, where our party parted ways. The ladies went on a driving tour of Newport to see the mansions and estates that are ubiquitous there. Us guys went to have a proper guy lunch and afterward headed off to the Newport Car Museum and see some great cars. And boy did we see some cars! Later that evening, we attended a private reception in an undisclosed location where Audrain keeps some serious beauties. For example, this is a race-winning 1907 Renault model AI 3545 horsepower in original unrestored condition. Stunning car! Here's one even more stunning. This is the 1927 Isola Frescini that was ordered by and for Rudolf Valentino. Unfortunately, he died shortly after, and the car was completed after his death. But I mean, just look at it. Yes, it was a car made for a movie star. And cars of the era were good for gangsters as well, like this 1931 Chrysler Imperial. I can almost hear Bob say, You dirty rat! We all gathered for dinner that night, toasting the occasion, eating like kings and queens and enjoying the Bayside views. We were all excited for the next day's tour and energized by the fellowship of friends and family all brought together by a car. A car that needed love. 